says, since then we have a great high priest, this Jesus, we have this high priest who has purchased something for us, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, with, who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have a high priest who has paved a way for us. He has made a path that is simple for us to walk. It is a walk that we do by faith. And as we walk by faith, we can get into the presence of God by following his way, only his way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, only Jesus' way. But if we go his way, we can go before God with confidence. This confidence that we have, that we may approach the throne with, this boldness, is not the spirit of entitlement that our culture um, promotes, that our culture is so obsessed with. We are encouraged, commanded, to consider ourselves in the presence of God. And though we may approach boldly and go into the throne room of God's presence in our prayers and say with confidence, I have a right to be here because that right has been given to me. That does not mean that when we get there, we do whatever it is that we want to do. It does not mean that when we get there, we behave in a disrespectful or entitled manner. I've heard so many people pray, and in their prayers, they are extremely disrespectful to God because of passages like this, because they've missed misunderstood that the boldness that we are encouraged to approach God's throne with is not also a boldness to order God around. And yet they, they say to God, you must do this and you must do that. And you have, you have to do this for me and that. And that is not what this passage is teaching. The big point here is that we have access to God. We have been given a way to get to him by our perfect high priest, a way that was not there before. And we have a responsibility, an opportunity to not neglect this bold approach. So let me ask all of ourselves this morning, myself included, how often are you speaking with God because you have been given that right? How often do you speak to God? Do you pray? Do you approach Him with the various opportunities and challenges of your life? Are you in the habit of considering yourself in the throne room of God? Finding that you need His grace and mercy to help in time of need? Or do, do we, do I just go about my life making it through on my own every day? I'm fine. I've got this covered. I don't need God's help. Not because I don't acknowledge that I need God's help, but because I act as if I don't. I don't, I don't live as if God were important to me. Do I live in this bold approach to the throne of grace? This place where I get help when I need it. And when I approach, am I approaching in a respectful way? Consider the gravity of the place that we are approaching, that we are entering. It is not a holy place made with hands, a mere shadow like the temple or the tabernacle. How careful were the children of Israel to be in their approach to that image of the holy place that we are told that we get to enter for real? Well, let me think of a couple examples. Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, were approaching the tabernacle. They got to the entrance of the tabernacle, and they had censers in their hands. And those censers were to be a symbol of worship and prayer to God. And God had prescribed a specific recipe of spices that were to go into those censers. And those censers were only to be lit from a particular fire, the fire in the brazen altar inside the tabernacle. And they approached, lit those censers with a different fire. The Old Testament calls it a strange fire. And as they got to the doorway of the tabernacle, fire came down from heaven and burnt them to death right there. 
This is not a place that you approach carelessly. Or another, another man, a really, really good king, one of Israel's top five, his name was Uzziah. And he had a very strong, godly reign. He obeyed God in so many things. And when he got near to the end of his life, and he'd been reigning for 25, 30 years, he got it into his head that he was such a good king, that he had done such a good job, that he had the right to enter the temple, the holy place, and there in the holy place to perform the offices of a priest. And the high priest that was there, he confronted Uzziah and said, Uzziah, this is not for you. Do not proceed one step further. This is the holy place, and only the sons of Aaron may enter here. And Uzziah said, I'm a really good king. God wants me in there. And he went in there, and immediately leprosy sprang out on his forehead. And he was banished not just from the temple, but from the city for the rest of his reign. And his son reigned, co-reigned with him for the, rest of his, for the remaining years of his life. A really, really good king approached the place of the symbols of God's presence with a, in a disrespectful way. And this is how God responded. Brothers and sisters, we may, in fact, we must, we have been commanded to approach the throne of grace with boldness. But that does not mean that we are disrespectful or careless in the way in which we do this. We need to be careful about how we enter. We need to be considering the gravity of the place that we are entering. We also need to consider the means that, have, that were used to give us an entrance. A new and living way has been made for us. The first two-thirds of the book of Hebrews, like I, like I mentioned earlier, is showing us that the old way was insufficient and inferior. But now this new way is super efficient. It is super abundant in the provision that it makes. It connects us to life himself. It connects us through Jesus Christ's death to God the Father. We need to approach with thankfulness and gratefulness, not expecting God to do for us, but praising God for what he already has done for us. There is only one way to make this approach, and that is through Jesus, through a life that is like Jesus Christ's. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience. He died in our place. And this passage here tells us that he tore apart the veil. The veil in the Old Testament tabernacle in the temple was a symbol of separation, a thick fabric, a thick layering of, of fabrics and skins that was to make it very clear that certain people are allowed to enter here and certain people are not. There are some scholars who think that this veil that was in the temple or in the tabernacle originally was two to three inches thick. All right? It wasn't gauzy stuff that was easy to rip. It was a thick, impenetrable, absolutely opaque, stiff, difficult to pass veil. And when Jesus died on the cross, when he said it is finished and Father into your hands, I commit my spirit. We are told that the veil in the temple was torn in two, ripped from top to bottom. Because Jesus, through his flesh, through his death, destroyed the symbol of separation. Because Jesus, our high priest, has passed through the veil in his death into the presence of the Father, we no longer need priests. There's no longer any need for any mediators between God and man. The tribe of Aaron, excuse me, the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron, it was their responsibility to be those mediators, and they were the only ones who could pass through that veil. But since Jesus passed through the veil, and it has been torn, there's no longer any need for a mediator. We get to talk directly to God. We get to deal with him personally. Our forgiveness is a matter of conversation. Not, a, not any longer a matter of blood sacrifice. And that is a beautiful, wonderful thing that we have been given. Our confidence ought to be the confidence of the prodigal son. I think that's probably the best illustration I can come up with for how we approach the throne of God. Remember him? It was the father's love, not the son's merit, that promoted 
the prodigal son's welcome. He had demanded his inheritance, run off and wasted it in foolish and sinful living. And he comes back and says, I just want to be around my dad again. It doesn't matter in what capacity I am there. I'll, I'll be the lowest servant if only I can be with him. If only I can be around him. He approached with reluctance and respect and a little bit of fear of being rejected. But the father ran to meet him. We have a bold approach because of the welcome of our father. Let us be valuing that. We have confidence, verses 19 and 20. We also have Christ, verse 21. Verse 21 says, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. This brief reference ought to bring our minds to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. There, the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle. An apostle is someone who is sent. Jesus was sent by the Father to perform a function in this world to offer a good news. So he is the apostle. He is also the high priest of our confession. He is the primary mediator. He who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. We are called to have confidence because of the precious sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have a different kind of high priest. He is superior to Moses. Moses is the contractor who built the house. He built the house for Jesus Christ, and we are invited to live in it with him. Moses made bricks and mortar, but the architect of the building is Jesus. He is the one who pioneered for us a way to get into the various and into the very presence of God. It is not like Isaiah, woe is me, for I am undone. It is not even like John, who seeing Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 falls down and cannot get up. We have an invitation to always be speaking to the Father, to our Heavenly Father, about what is going on in our lives. We are called to draw near. Do we? Do we make it a daily habit to draw near to God? Or are we just living without reference to His presence? It is such a precious gift that he has given us. But as I look back at the last week, even while I was studying this, as I look back at the, the last years of my life, I consider that I have not been drawing near. As precious as this opportunity is, I have not been accessing it like I ought to be. We have access through the mediator, who is Jesus Christ. This is what we have. We've been given a great gift. What should we, we be doing with this? Well, let's draw near in faith, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near. This is an eternally desperate paradox that every human being is born into. How can we draw near to the one in whose presence we are undone, like Isaiah says, but without whose presence we are eternally dead? We need God. He is life, physical and spiritual, but we are born separated from him. And to get into his presence on our own terms means destruction. It is just an eternally desperate paradox. There's no way we can fix it. It is a hopeless situation. How may we dare to draw near to the one in whose presence we are undone, but without whose presence we are dead? And thus far, all of Hebrews has been an argument to answer this question. We may draw near by means of Jesus Christ as offered in the new covenant. But to do this, we must meet certain conditions. We are called here in this verse, verse 22, to have a true heart, a genuine engagement of the inner man. Our heart, our, our, the center of our 
highest desires, our best hopes, centered on Jesus Christ. A genuine engagement of the inner man which constitutes true worship. James, just a few pages further in your Bible, verses one, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, gives us kind of an opposite of that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So we are warned against approaching with a faithless heart. Let's dig into this here a little bit and look at verses 2 through 4. How do we approach with a true heart? 2 through 4 in James chapter 1 is a pretty good example. He says, James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that it may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We ought to respond to testing with joy. Not because of the testing itself. We're not called to be masochists enjoying pain of any kind in our lives. But because of the result of testing, a fully mature, growing Christ-likeness in our lives. But this is hard to swallow. Seeing joy and crushing sorrow in our own lives is not, not an easy thing. Many of us, perhaps even all of us, have experienced great sorrow in our lives. Various things that have crushed our hearts and destroyed our expectations and our hopes. How do we respond to that with joy? Verses 5 through 8 gives us a means whereby, by asking God for the wisdom to respond right. But to have that wisdom, to have that certitude that God is doing well even though I'm feeling pain, the only way to approach that is through single-mindedness. A heart, a desire, a focus that is entirely designed toward God and his purposes in our lives. If that is the case, then it doesn't matter if we have a little or if we have a lot. James 1, 9, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation let, and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the grass and its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in his pursuits. It doesn't matter what you have, what you don't. If you have God, if his wisdom is guiding you, if your response is joy in all circumstances because you know that the testing of your faith is going to produce steadfastness and Christ-likeness in the end. This is a true heart, a heart whose treasure is God and God alone. We are called to draw near, but one of the conditions for drawing near is a true heart. A heart, the goal of which is God's ascendancy in their life. The fear of the Lord. We've talked about that a little bit lately, right? That puzzle piece right in the middle, surrounded by the little ones. Everything plugs in to him. We are called to have a true heart. We're also called to have full assurance of faith there in, back in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. And specifically in this context, in Hebrews chapter 10, what the author of Hebrews is saying is you're used to putting your faith in following a sacrificial system and attending certain feasts and eating a certain diet and making sure all your males are circumcised on the eighth day. You're used to having all these rules, all these laws, and you put your faith in an adherence to them. That's a shadow on the wall, just, just a blurry, indistinct, and, and two-dimensional image compared with what we have now. Now we have Christ, and he is glorious, and he has length, and width, and depth, like none of those shadows ever had. We need to have full assurance of faith in him. You can't mix Jesus Christ with the blood of bulls and goats, or any other work. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Titus 3, 5. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For some reason, although I do have them memorized, they lost, I lost them just now. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Thank you, Paul. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. I find that last verse, verse 10, so encouraging. We memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 in Awana back when I was a kid. And I imagine it's, it's, it's something that's in many Christians' heads frequently. And it's, they're an excellent set of verses and directions to us to not get our minds focused on the wrong thing. But verse 10 for those of us who struggle with temptation in our lives and say, God, it seems like every time I stand up, I fall back down. And I fall further. What's going on? How can I not win? God has a promise for us here. Uh, for those of you who do struggle with that, read Romans chapter 7. That's a blessing. And then since you've read Romans chapter 7, read Romans chapter 8, because that's a blessing too. But we're going to get our answer in brief here in Ephesians 2.10. And that is that if you are God's child, having accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then he has plans for you to do good works. He has before ordained that you're going to walk in them. So if you're discouraged because you aren't as single-minded. You don't have a true heart like we talked about a couple minutes ago. Or you don't have this full assurance of faith. Be certain that you have Jesus Christ in your life. Be certain at least, if you're not doing good works that you think you need to be doing, that you are repentant and willing to repent every time you are called to do so. God has got plans for you. He's got plans for you. And though you may be discouraged, I know that you may be because I often am. Those plans are going to go from now until the end of your life. And you're going to walk in good works for him. That doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. There are going to be many moments of failure, many reflections of shame. If your life is anything like mine, but God has before ordained good works for you to be doing. And that's a reason for joy, for excitement, for anticipation. So we are called to draw near through a true heart, through full assurance of faith, and then finally, excuse me, not finally, heart sprinkled clear from an evil conscience. This passage actually is a reference back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. So let's go back there. Ezekiel is the last really big book in your Old Testament. If you're in the Little Prophets, you've got to go back a little earlier. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord your God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations which know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness in their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries. I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. How many of you look at your life and say, you know, I'm not careful to obey his rules. I don't walk in his statutes like I know I ought to. This is an Old Testament promise to the nation of Israel regarding the millennium. All right? So I understand that this does not apply directly to us. This is not written to Christians in the church. But this is what God is like. All right? And if God is like this to his people in the Old Testament, he's like this to his children in all times. God is removing the stoniness from your heart. And he is putting a heart tender to his leading instead in its place. He is working in you both to desire and to do his good pleasure. Now you may be fighting him right now. By the way, that's as dumb as a bag of hammers. Fight God? No, don't do that. All right? You may be fighting him right now. 
but he is changing you into the image of his son. If you fight him, the sparks are going to fly. If you go with him, you're looking at a life of joy and peace. Now, no, it's not going to be a life of health, wealth, and prosperity. It may not be an easy life, but it's a life of joy and peace in the center of his will, a fulfilling life. This is what we have. He, in his promises to the nation of Israel regarding the millennium, goes on in verse 28 and says, You shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant, and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you will never again suffer disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will, be rem you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and the abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord, God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confound, confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. On that day, says the Lord God, I will cleanse you from all your iniquities. I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste, shall, waste places shall be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled. Indeed, the beginning of desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and the desolate and the ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which, which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. God is determined to glorify himself. And he's going to glorify himself in his children here on this earth. This is the way that he promises he will do it in the nation of Israel in the future. But he is like this now in our lives too. He is like this now, and he will be glorified. He will do it for his own name's sake. But he also does it in ways that bring us such great joy and peace and opportunity of service. So our approach to the throne of grace is no longer Isaiah 6, woe is me for I am undone. Rather it is Hebrew 4, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, the passage that we read earlier. We have a bold approach. We are called finally in the final condition in verse 22 to have bodies washed with pure water, continually cleansed of our sin. So we are called to hold fast, to draw near in faith, excuse me, let us also hold fast in hope. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We are not to hold fast to hope, to the feeling that God is with me, to the feeling that God's okay with me. We are called here to hold fast to our confession, which is the source of our hope. Do you all see the distinction there? So often we are obsessed with feeling a certain way. But what we are called to hold fast to, to desire to retain, is not the feeling but rather, it is the source of our confession. It is the truth of God's promises. This is what we are called to hold fast to. I think all of us experience times where we feel in our Christian lives like things are dry, things are down, things are difficult. And very often in those times, we ask God why, and we give up, and we're discouraged, and, and we, we, have, we have difficulties. I think that very often happens to us. I know that it often happens to me because I am worshiping the feeling. I am desiring the feeling of God's presence in my life instead of just acknowledging his promises and meeting the conditions. A life free from sin and focused on his glory. The feeling is not what we are to be worshiping. It is God. Do not mistake the one for the other. We are not holding fast to hope. We are holding fast to our confession, which is the source of our hope. This holding fast itself produces and increases the hope, which in turn strengthens our grip on the confession that we are told to hold on to. It's an exponential interaction of obedience and blessing. A hopeless believer is a contradiction of terms. Hope is the daughter of faith. Faith says, God, I believe that you will do what you have promised. Hope follows that. Knowing that I believe, I have nothing to fear.
Let us hold fast by hope. And finally, verses 24 and 25, let us consider to love. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Make plans to stir things up. Well, that's not exactly what the author of Hebrews is saying. Make plans to stir each other up, to love. To stir one another up to love. How do, what does that mean? How do we do that? How do we stir one another up to love? Well, it's by example. It's by doing it yourself, not by expecting others to do it for you. What is this love? Well, it's, it's sacrificing your own rights, your inclinations, considering the needs and desires and wants of others more, uh, of more significance than your own. We read that in Philippians chapter 2 this morning earlier, right? That is how we are to stir one another up to love and good works, by ourselves sacrificing so that we can stir others up, so we can build them up. A desire to create a crescendo of God-glorifying works. A collective effort toward faith, toward even reckless faith. We are also commanded here not only to stir one another up to love and good works, but also to not neglect fellowship. Do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together. Neglect makes fellowship impossible. Brothers and sisters, we need each other. I need you. I need you in my life for encouragement, for confrontation, for blessing. I really do, and I feel that need. I need you. We need each other. If we feel that we don't need each other, if we're okay without each other, then something is out of joint in our Christian life. Something is wrong. There is an arrogance, a pride, a self-sufficiency, a blindness to sin in our lives if we don't feel that we need each other. So if you feel, not, not if you confess in your mind, but if you feel that you're okay as a Christian, you can go it alone. I don't need my brothers and sisters to encourage, to help, to confront, to challenge me. If you feel like you're just fine, there's something wrong. In you, there is. And it needs to be confronted and dealt with. Because we need each other. We are told that we need each other here. We need each other as a body of Christ. We need each other to be confronted. We need each other to build each other up. Because neglect makes fellowship impossible, and neglect produces apostasy. Apostasy is departing from the faith. is saying, ah, Christianity, it's not so much an important thing. I'm not a Christian anymore. Or it's, it's straying from important doctrines and losing the central component of Christianity, the, the God's glory in the gospel. So neglect produces a straying from the faith. Neglect hurts us as a church. Selfishness and divisiveness go hand in hand. For self-love breeds a spirit of self-isolationism. He who does not love his fellow Christian